a platform to sharing your thoughts. Namaskar, you are watching City Live and I am Amit Kalla. Welcome to all of you. In our special episode, uh, under the segment of Art Dialogue, which a bucket of live sessions uh, with the great personalities, with the legendaries associated with the visual and performing arts. So today, uh, two international stars of uh, visual arts are with us. I would like to welcome Daniel Connell from South Australia and Johnny Amell from South India, South of India. So Daniel is renowned painter, focuses on huge human faces, a lovable man, a curator, uh, whereas Johnny Amell did his art education from MS University, Baroda and uh, London. So he's originally an intense poet, an intense poet, a thinker, a philosopher, uh, of course, a famous art critic and and an art uh, uh, and and uh, and an art uh, critic and an art critic. So uh, both of these personalities are great masters of their own kind. So first of all, I would like to ask Daniel, sir, tell us something about your foundness, about your inclination, about your love, about your trustful relationship with Indian communities and culture. What are those elements on both sides which allows you to become a part of this unending flow? Daniel. Thanks very much, Amit. And um, it's a great opportunity to meet with Johnny Amel, who I've heard a lot about previously. Um, and to, to see you again, I mean, thank you very much for inviting me to be on this. Um, my connection with India, I don't know. I think it goes back past in past lives. Um, uh, I had always had a strong inclination to go to India since I was a small child. Um, I was swept away when I saw a version of the Mahabharata when I was 18. Uh, and that stayed with me in a troubling, disturbing way. And then I uh, eventually got the opportunity to go to India um, I, 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 we were just discussing before, sorry, when I was about 13, I saw the movie Gandhi, which I know has, uh, has been critiqued many times by many people, but um, that moved me really, really deeply. And so all these different sort of pivotal moments in my life, India has been there to inspire me and push me uh, along the way. Um, there was all, there was a discussion recently I was involved in about superpowers and I've always thought, um, you know, there's this always discussion about, you know, is India going to be the next superpower? Is India going to be the next superpower? And I know we've just talked about this before, but if we actually look about look at superpower as being influential, India has been a superpower, if not one of the world's first superpowers, and I don't think it has ever stopped. It's just been a superpower in philosophy and thought and spiritual. If that sort of dictates my attraction to India, then... I was attracted to that because it was so influential in the way I was thinking. It changed my sort of Judeo-Christian mindset into something much more abstract. Uh, and then I finally got the chance to go to India when I was 34 and I've, uh, sorry, when I was 37 and I've never stopped going back there. It has a magnetic pull on you and I can't stop uh, talking and thinking about India in every way. So it has a massive influence on my art, my career, my thinking, my life, everything. Not sure if that answers your question, Amit. Uh, Johnny, sir, uh, what should I call you? An art critic, a curator, a poet, a writer, or an art activist? Mm -hmm. How do you see yourself in, in, in different roles? Yeah, actually, it is so interesting a question because whenever I go to the public platforms, many people don't still don't have this idea of being an art historian. So they call me an artist. Sometimes, like they call me an art critic, art writer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they still don't know this idea of art historian. Art, how do how do you create art history? You know, because that is not very much in our Indian parlance. Uh, but as far as I am concerned, when I look at myself, I'm a basically like you people, like Amit and uh, Daniel, and so many people who are watching this program. Uh, I find myself as a creative person. 
creativity is something like very innate actually every human being from right from the very beginning of say like uh, the scientists the, uh, the evolutionary biologists say that like uh, 60000 years human human beings like homo sapiens have been there and uh, this creative uh, creative aspect they, they 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 call it the evolutionary biologists call it like uh, uh, camps campsite storytellers they come in the evening around the fire because they don't have anything to do so they start telling the stories actually uh, as a historian as a writer or uh, as a creative person as an activist or or a poet or a thinker whatever you call me like there is a sense of storytelling i mean in your case like i can see your painting just behind you like you are trying to tell a story that the in a language which is understand understood by you know people from all over the world but to 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 hear that story to listen to that story you need to have a special ear that ear is actually in your eyes you know so if you if if anybody actually like even when i look at you uh you are a poet actually you are a writer you make your uh, art criticism and art critique in your in your hindi language and per- primarily you identify yourself as an artist so in my case like uh, somewhere you have to position yourself like for a public identity for a, for for a for a social identity because recently i mean if i if i tell you a small story recently i met uh, uh met my friend's dad in my village so okay. my friend is in the middle east countries and he's earning quite a lot quite well he's doing quite well in my in his life and uh, daniel it is very interesting if you look at me like with this beard and all like you know people consider a bearded person not the sick people not the sardarjis like a bearded person he either he could be a marxist or he could be a revolutionary a rebel or somebody who hasn't done anything with his life who hasn't made any progress progress in his life you know he's a failure that is those are the people who grow beard you know so uh, this this dad of uh, my friend he asked me like what are you doing these days so i told him that i am i am an art historian so he said oh acha utna hi hai only that much so actually basically he didn't understand what i am doing you know so i i prefer not to talk about my my professional uh, identity as a curator or as a as a as a, an art historian or a critic to the public mm-hmm. i i prefer to say that like i i i am a writer writer you know writer could be uh, anybody who but still people ask that how do you earn your money okay writing is fine <laughs> so yeah yeah but i would call myself as a creative person 24 to 7 mm. that's it yeah great great sir thank you thank you so much daniel as an artist mm. how do you think of this uh, this social distancing as we know that you are a man of masses you love to meet people you love to connect with more and more people so in such a critical situation in such a corona time how do you respond That's interesting. Um fascinating to hear your response to the last question too Johnny. I must say um before I answer I mean it's question uh, it's the same with me if people ask you know are you an artist what do you do I'm an artist the people sort of go ah oh, ah oh, hmm. oh that's nice you know sort of bit bit patronizing. Um so regarding the the social distancing um look it's really interesting at the beginning of this corona thing people were going ah oh, you know how are artists going to cope and you know the thing was you know everybody exhibitions stopped and people were worried about funding and how they were going to live and rightly so um sort of a lot of my income was dropped by 75% because um we couldn't teach face to face it's it so same as in australia as it, as it is in india and um and i saw one artist make a comment that said oh bliss we can all stay home you know this is what artists love to do and i thought it but i both resonated with that yes i like my own time i like being solitary i like time to think i like to be alone i enjoy that but at the same time it made me really angry because i thought actually um you can only do that if you've got money to support yourself and so many artists and creative people just don't have the money we're always doing something 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 to help 
get food on the table to pay our bills, to pay for the mobile and pay for the electricity and pay for whatever. And I thought, well, there's a very few artists and creative people in the world who've got the money to just be able to be alone and to isolate ourselves. So I felt both resonating with that and I, I do enjoy the solitariness. But to add on to that, last week we had our first face-to-face -face meeting with our the painting department at the college where I work. And we'd been doing everything on Zoom, Zoom, you know, Zoom this, Zoom that, Zoom everything else. And we were seeing, like now, seeing ourselves on a screen and seeing people in tiny little thumbnails. And we had planned a face-to-face -face meeting with social distancing, of course. And I, three days before that, I began to get very excited. Like all I could think about was the meeting we were going to have on Monday. Like we've got a meeting, we've got a meeting. In normal times, we wouldn't, I wouldn't even think about that. But we all came together in the one room and we talked about what we needed to talk about within 10 minutes, but we couldn't stop that meeting for two hours. We kept on talking and talking and talking and talking. And I realized that there is something intangible that I've really noticed through this about the energy of being in the same room with somebody that yeah. I've missed. And I think everybody else has missed that. And I think gradually I've seen people go in. I've also become angry sometimes and even more angry than usual i mean <laughs> but um <laughs> uh, but you know i that energy we get from people like is so intangible but so needed it's so you know it, i think that i've seen people and i've seen in my students as well sometimes you know we're hesitant to talk on these zoom things but in this face to face we can talk so much you know, 70% of, of human communication is body language. And on this little thumbnail, it's really hard to get that. So I've really missed that sort of stuff. So that's just, that's not from an artistic perspective, but it's just my perspective, I think. That, that, uh, that matters a lot. Thanks. That matters mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, Johnny, sir, uh, as Daniel has uh, reflected his uh, perception about this, uh, this, this solitude, uh, so how do you analyze the overall impact of such uh, circumstances on various practices? Uh, what are your expectations from artists and uh, as well as from the promoting institutions, I mean galleries or, or the people who are in the governance? Johnny, sir. Yeah. Like, first of all, the social distancing, the word social distancing is a misnomer. We have to accept that social distancing is actually a negative. It has a negative connotation in Indian caste practice. Like, you know, you keep social distancing between castes. So actually, in any part of the world, this is all about physical distancing. Like, you should not touch another person. You should be standing six feet away, one and a half meter away from a person who, I mean, for the fear of getting affected of coronavirus. Uh, but anyway, people just were forced to get into, uh, get into isolation be locked down by the government. It is not by choice. It is the governments ask the people to go. If you look at the Swedish experience, like in Sweden, like uh, the government said that, okay, the whole responsibility is on people. Like you could come out, you could go to, go to restaurants or pubs or anywhere, but only thing is that you have to uh, observe, you have to obey this kind of, uh, uh, or uh, the, the kind of uh, strictures or the kind of uh, kind of uh, instructions given by World Health Organization. So they successfully did it. But only thing is that there is, as uh, uh, Daniel said earlier, in, like in Australia, in South of Australia, like uh, you don't have so many people. The population is very like is very different. You yeah. know, then most of the people like who could afford to be alone in their private rooms, in their private homes, and and think that like, uh, or they could have thought that uh, they would do a lot of creative work. The writers would write, the dancers would compose, choreograph new dance pieces, musicians will compose, etc., etc. But nothing happened. You know something? The, it's it's called bolt your door from inside. 
and you prefer to be away from that from the world and you want to isolate you want some kind of a solitude to be to to, to create something you bolt your door from inside where you are the authority you are the authority at will because the bolt is put by you locked from outside so you don't know the government has to say so these are two different mindsets so it affected people tremendously we have to accept the fact people people were affected tremendously those people who thought that they could create a lot of things failed to do it for a long time because you know human beings need hope something called hope to live on so the first phase of lockdown second phase of lockdown third phase and by fourth phase the government decided to give some relaxations so people started seeing some light at the other end of the tunnel so decided to do something so people started writing the writers started writing artists started painting and of course there are some artists who kept on painting kept on singing etc etc writing etc uh, unaffected by or pretending that they were not affected by the whole scenario uh, i mean i i i wish them best all the best and uh, good luck because you can't live like that as daniel rightly said like you need a human human proximity you need to talk to people you know uh, what what uh, the, the greatest thing that was denied to the human beings was primarily touch people need to touch touch you know shaking hands hugging holding each other etc etc it is denied maybe in due course of time we all will turn into such people like who wouldn't like to touch each other because giorgio agamben the italian science so social scientist and theoretician he said the now the enemy is not the virus but the carrier who is a human being so our primary enemy is the human being so we are controlling our we are actually censoring our own touch you know okay now the coming to your question what happened to the government and uh, galleries etc etc the, the yeah. cultural agencies yeah they also became exactly the same like any other bureaucratic establishment whether it is private uh, museum or private gallery everybody like daniel rightly pointed out earlier like every everything was turned into zoom webinars the one of the funniest words i have ever experienced or heard webinar you know <laughs> so the the webinars and webinars also became the places where people could chit chat and they could talk about their you know their 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 private fancies and the private uh, snow snowberries etc etc i came i i came across and I, i i sat through certain things and i found that it is quite abominable you know so uh, if we want to live on actually we have to reimagine ourselves because the post covid days the post corona days if there is a scenario like that we the human beings have to reimagine ourselves as a part of the whole universal scheme and also uh, as artists and creative people we need to ask ourselves whether our creative strategies our our disseminating strategies are going to be the same or not mm-hmm. we need to take responsibility we need to be more responsible towards our living and we need to develop a holistic ideas about life uh, in general yeah okay okay uh, sir uh, from last two months uh, two or three months uh, we come across through lots of uh, online art camps and exhibitions does these kind of practices have uh, any relevance uh, how do you found the role of curator in such uh, such art practices such online art practices see uh, i think like uh, <clears throat> uh, having something online and having something offline where the tactile Uh, physical presence is very important in, in offline so that is a different experience altogether so having an online exhibition or having an online auction or having an online camp these could be a human desperation or a desperate attempt of the human beings or anybody who involves in their respective fields who want to replicate the same experience as off as an offline 
in the online platforms, which I find is absolutely impossible in its general sense and absolutely meaningless in its uh, fundamental sense. Why meaningless? It's not. I'm not. I'm not saying that it is meaningless in terms of uh, human interaction. Mm -hmm. Their inter human interaction happens, but meaning of art, work of art, is about seeing it. A work of art is to be seen. Maybe we are not seeing all the Picassos and Van Goghs and even Daniel's work. We are seeing it online, uh, but having an, a, a direct experience makes all the difference. And we have to have a direct experience of something to actually validate the online experience. Suppose if we are going into a different economy of uh, digital imagery and the digital conversation and the digital uh, you know, exhibition, etc., etc. It's a different kind of economy. Economy of culture, actually. It becomes a totally different parlance, a different, a totally, totally different engagement, where we need to become as digitized or as as digital as anything else. So our human nature, it is, it is a fundamental movement against the human nature. Mm -hmm. We need to be human, then we need to have a, a human interactions. It is not just about the talking. It is not just about the showing painting or any other skill. It is about uh, coming together in a in a, in a in a in a social manner where values are created in the online it is a very sanitized way of approach exactly. people can actually sermonize people can actually uh, say a lot of rhetoric a lot of uh, preaching etc etc but the real social context is where human interactions generate real value the value system and without value system, we, we can't survive. I think like and the post-COVID scenario, we need to create a different value system where we could be online and offline at the same time. Exactly. exactly. And, and aesthetic is that, that, that real experience. So, mm -hmm. so there is something, the lack of experience in, to this, in this medium. So Daniel, uh, which new trends as an art curator do you find inspiring at the moment, and what are your new ideas for exhibitions, for coming exhibitions? Um, yeah, very interesting, and all great points put forward by Johnny there. Um, uh, and he, I suppose, has led into what I think is the new movement. I mean, I think that I think the cutting edge of contemporary art at the moment is in social practice, so social engaged practice, and. Um, that's where I spend most of my time. So I am a drawer and a painter, um, but um, I'm interested in what goes after, after the object, what comes after the making of the object. And I think that most of the really interesting writing and work that's coming out at the edge of that is in, it's my, my personal opinion is in social engaged practice where people are sort of trying to get to the heart of well, what does this art thing actually do you know we know sort of what it looks like or we know what something you know what art sort of should look like and then there's a lot of people who sort of create stuff that looks like art but i don't know whether it is art or not but you know we know what it should look like feel like smell like but um what does it actually do and why do we keep doing it and why is it important and i think a lot of that wrestling and and a lot of the stuff too with that is about um uh, having arguments about whether it's ethical or or not too, um, and what we're doing with people. So I think that is, um, I think that is the new and interesting place where I'm at. Now that can take place in a gallery, it can take place in a museum, it can take place in all sorts of other places and other venues as well. It could be in a road or a room or a house. It can be in streets. It can be. Uh, it, it can be documented, it can be undocumented, it can be um, visual, it can be non-visual, visual. it can be invisible. Um, and I think that pushes the, the, uh, the thinking around what art is and what art does um, beyond uh, a, the limited aspect of it being even visual. Um, uh, and I think, I suppose I've, uh, if we're talking about curation, um, I think curation is a particular skill uh, that 
that we have. But um, within the socially engaged practice, we're always thinking about people and relationships first and foremost. And I think that is the that is the, at the core of what curators do too. Uh, they're thinking about objects and they're thinking about visuals, but they're also thinking about relationships and ideas. Um, and that's why I think social engaged practice often really gets to the heart of all the important things that's happening in the art world at the moment. Uh, then it does uh, art uh, need respond to reality? What do you think? Um, that's a really interesting point, I think, Amit. Does it need to respond to reality? Um, I think that, I think that um, the job of the artist is to always ask what's going on. That's what, um, and that, that what's going on could be the smallest of questions and it could be the biggest of questions. And I think that uh, all art is actually research. All art is investigation. That's why artists talk about investigation and exploration, all that sort of stuff. But I think all art is research and all art asks a question. And that I think at the core of it, that question is the simple question, what's going on? So the figurative painter or drawer might be saying, what's going on with this figure? Where is it placed in composition? Where is it placed in the room? Um, the landscape maker might be asking, what's going on with these colors and these tones? Um, the uh, dancer might be saying, what's going on with this music? What's going on with the rhythm? What's going on? So what's going on with those sorts of things? And then we get bigger questions like, what's going on in this relationships? What's going on between these two people? What's going on uh, in the world? What's going on in the politics? What's going on in government? What's going on in health? What's going on in biology? What's going on? So that, that question, I think we're always asking questions of the reality. And I think naturally, uh, artists are curious people, they're always looking at things, but I think they're interested too in looking at things from a different, as many different perspectives as possible. So um, I don't know how we, artists are you know, human beings and we all live um, together in relationship with each other, but we're curious to adopt any anything possible. And um, like I think Johnny ML's um, Johnny's blog spot is called "By All Means Possible." Is that it? By all uh, means. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's. I think that's a really good name. Meaning, um, we're absolutely looking from every angle um, to try and um, explore things from as many different ways as possible. So in that case, I don't. I think artists are immersed in reality all the time but also questioning what is reality so uh, if that's answers that question not sure Great. i can tend to ramble a bit <laughs> uh johnny sir uh johnny sir what are new opportunities uh, for uh, for coming artists uh, regarding to this uh, this economic uh, point of view for art because lots of artists are associated with this channel uh, are our spectators yeah it's a it's a it's a very crucial question that you have asked uh, as you, as i said earlier like a post covid scenario is uh, fundamentally different from the pre covid scenario so the economy is also going to be different it is going to present a totally different model, absolutely different model. And we cannot definitely replicate what we have been uh, using as a kind of uh, economic parameter uh, as far as art scene, uh, art market was concerned. Art market had its own ups and downs all this while. And we have been going through a kind of great major market slump all these years, like probably for the last seven to eight years, we couldn't recover, but still, there are hopes because some people are still supporting art some people are still supporting culture but def, uh, it is not going to be in the it, it is not going to be the same way as we have seen it sometime between 2005 and 2008 or to 2012 or something but artists need to work artists are going to work because they are the people who are destined to work. They don't have any other way. But whether the world is going to pay them for uh, um, to make a living, uh, to account a living uh, through art, I don't know. I'm not sure because, you know, it all depends on the patrons. They want to buy the art, the kind of art they want. And if you look at the art stars, 
like uh, we have this uh, 10 15 names like uh, who are supposed to be the superstars of indian art and every country has got their own uh, share of uh, superstars they are also like sinking first of all they are sinking in aesthetics because they couldn't make any impact after a particular time they have been self repeating they are make they have been making self references and they were not putting forward any fresh approach this is where what daniel said is absolutely crucial why because art is a research Art has to research continuously into the society. It has to make incisions and see inside what is going on inside the society and how its its brain work as a collective a collective brain works and how the collective cultures are formed and histories are formed. Artist's role is that. Artist's role as a market caution or market component is not that important because. If the market is such a thing that if you are not providing the material, the raw material or the, the product for the market, somebody else would. That is why like nobody is uh, like uh, uh, indispensable or something. Everybody is uh, disp dispensable as far as the uh, art market is concerned. So you your art, which is to be important, which is to be philosophically worthy, which is to be historically re relevant, which is economically viable, then you need to think in all these different terms. Your paradigm should be moving around. Actually, you can't work on the kind of monolith of a genu genius artist sitting and working and uh, some pattern coming and uh, supporting you. You can expect the patterns coming from absolutely unexpected quarters and supporting the artist. And uh, whereas the, 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 the regular patterns of art, the regular buyers of art absolutely leaving, washing their hands and running away from the market. We have seen it in Indian art, art market. Like uh, uh, if you remember uh, this Bombay, Bombay gallery, uh, I, I forgot, Abhay Mascara. Abhay Mascara. Mm, Mascara, Mascara. Even before that, like the Devi Art Foundation. Like they, they, they I, I know, sorry, Devi Art Foundation, even before that, Bothi Art Gallery, Amit Judge. Bodhi. All, all these people, they came up with a lot of money. Religare Art Gallery, uh, uh, Religare, yeah. India Today Art Gallery, these were the people who were pumping money into art and making superstars out of ordinary mortals, mm -hmm. half-witted people, yeah. dumb <laughs> artists. But where did they go? Uh, they made their money, they just offloaded. It is like exactly like a Charles Saatchi. Charles, Sa Charles Saatchi once said, uh, uh, he, he had a tiff with Andrew, Andrew Chia. Uh, Santrochia. Santrochia is a is an Italian neo avant garde, okay. um, like a ends a, 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 a cookie Clemente and Chia. Enzo cookie Francisco Clemente and Santrochia. Santrochia is uh, based in uh, the US. Mm -hmm. So uh, Charles Sachi tried to offload his works, means underprice and sell it in the secondary market. So Sandar Shia became very agitated and he questioned this Charles Saatchi, how can you do this thing to me? So you, you, it is very important in art history that uh, Charles Saatchi answered to a famous great artist like Sandro Chia saying that your name in history will be remembered as an artist who is offloaded by Charles Saatchi. Okay. So there are so many artists like that offloaded by Amit Judge, offloaded by Abhay Maskara, offloaded by X or Y. We have to see that scenario. So if you can't go back, you can't go back to bring back that golden uh, era when uh, artists were like made to walk on the red carpets and the artists were made to uh, larger than life figures. We need to create new, we need to be really innovative. We need to be very research oriented so that uh, a new market structure a new pattern structure, a new uh, uh, work practice, work culture could be uh, evolved. And I don't want to, as a, as a senior member in this uh, art, art fraternity, I don't want to give any illusion to the young artist saying that, like, you know, you keep working, like Picasso said, follow your dreams, and Banksy cancelled it out, don't follow your dreams. Like that, I want to tell, like, Banksy, that you follow your dreams, but... Take it with a pinch of salt. Like you need to find alternative avenues to support uh, your life as a dignified entity. You need to live a dignified life. You can You need not struggle anymore because Beautiful. the whole world is suffering. And you also and suffering. It is not making any sense. Like right. you need to be really uh, into it as a researcher, as a, as a kind of philosopher.
Johnny sir, now I want to pass my microphone to you and uh, make a request to you to explore a little bit more Daniel through your perspective yeah. and your connotation. Uh, Daniel, when when Amit Amit asked me in the morning itself this uh, this particular thing, so I wanted to, I want to ask you that like uh, what what exactly are the curators doing say in in a in a museum in Adelaide and how they are different from a museum in say Perth or Sydney, you know places like that. Uh, uh, does it differ or there is a kind of uni universal paradigm for that like universe universal working practice for them. Look, that's a really, really interesting question, and it follows on from what you've just been so intelligently saying about the future of making a living through art. Oh, you've just sort of disappeared, but that's okay. Um, I think that what Johnny was just saying about making, you, Johnny, you were just saying about making a living from art is so important. See, the capitalist art structure has controlled the art market for so long and has dictated exactly what we should do and how the public should think about art. I think we're reaching a point where social engaged practice uh, is particularly, but also artists generally, and this COVID has accelerated it, that we can say, you know what, the capitalist art market has limited us and limited the public's understanding of what art is for far too long. And we should no longer rely on that um, you know, if they want to come along with artists and give their money, great. But if not, artists are going to find their own funding elsewhere. We're going to find it from health. We're going to find it from hospitals. We're going to find it from um, from uh, people who are not just buying art as a luxury item, but are investing in art as a social uh, a social need, uh, because art is actually a social need. It's not a luxury item, but. Um, the capitalist art market, which is the gallery system, which is, you know, everything that uh, Johnny was just talking about, has dictated to us what we should do, what we should make, how we should think about art. Now, following on from that is then the Biennale system. And the Biennale system has overtaken the world and paid artists to do whatever they like. So it's taken away, I suppose, the saleable object nature of what art is, which is a good thing. It can only be a step in the right direction. But then again, um, artists who used to just make for the capitalist art market to sell saleable luxury items are now sort of directing their work towards what is going to look good in a Biennale and what, um, you know, is going to get picked up by the next Biennale and how am I going to ingratiate myself with Biennale um, curators, etc., to get picked up and get paid. And that's one way to, of artists making money. Now, that being said, I think the best Biennale in the world is the Kochi Biennale, and I'm not just saying that because of India. I think it's one of the most democratic, the one of the most inclusive, one of the most exciting and multi-platform, because of its multi-platform nature in the world. And um, uh, I've been to every one of the Kochi Biennales, and I love it because of that. Um, so you're asking about um, curating in galleries. So I think that. Um, I love the gallery system here in, in Australia, but I think that the gallery system and the Biennale system, leading on from the capitalist art system, is doing very much the same as what everybody else in the world is doing. And that is, unfortunately, um, I think we've been taken over by the, the dominance of the spectacle and the dominance of social media. So galleries and Biennales, et cetera, are now creating selfie opportunities um, with spectacular and novel works of art that, you know, people can walk inside and walk in front of, etc. And that's a wonderful way of engaging people in art. But I think there's, I just think there's more to it than that. And um, it's a really, really good question. I don't think you can see a differentiation between um, a public Adelaide gallery or a private Adelaide gallery and one in Sydney or Melbourne, or that, or by that means one in Bombay or Delhi or, uh, London or Paris or New York. I think everybody's influenced by the same idea. And at the moment, it's about novelty and spectacle. And that has always been the case, but that's where we go. Now that said, I want to give one credit to the Adelaide, uh, the Art Gallery of South Australia, which is where I am, which a couple of years ago, when was it? Maybe, maybe five or six years ago, they changed the whole curation of the gallery so instead of being chronological, 
So, you know, you walk in in the first room and it's like um, pre-English occupation of Australia paintings, then it's sort of colonial paintings, then it's English occupation paintings, then it's 19th century paintings, then it's a 20th century painting, then it's modern art, then you get to the contemporary art at the end, then you get to the, um, then you get to the sort of the traveling shows. They completely threw that out, almost, but in one major wing, and they did it by themes. So they would have ancient art alongside contemporary art, literally hanging next to each other. So video work next to ancient Greek sculptures, which talked about um, representation of the figure, the human condition, um, seduction and love, death. Um, and so on those themes, you could look at artists over the last 3000 years talking about those themes. And that, the first time I saw that, it completely blew my mind. And I thought, this is really beautiful, clever curation in a public space, because it gets to the heart of what art is doing. It's not, it's not, art is not educative. It is emotional and it taps straight into our emotions. And as soon as we arrange things in a museum quality, in a chronological system, we start teaching people about history. Art should not have nothing to do with history, as apart from your art historian. But what you're really, I think, thinking about is not art chronological history. You're talking about art's value to humanity, uh, value to people. Um, art is less about history and more about um, time. Um, I've just spent some time in Mexico and, and that's what the people there were talking about, that history needs to be converted back to time and place needs to be converted back to space because the colonization of our minds yeah. turned time into history, meaning somebody's story of it, and then a space into a place that was named and owned. Art wrenches that back into a much more abstract concept. So you can walk through that gallery and think, wow, an ancient Syrian sculptor thought about death in this way, alongside a new upcoming person who's thinking about it in the last two years. They're not responding to each other necessarily, but they're responding to a human, a human, you know, um, need, a human feeling, a human experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very beautiful and interesting question. Thank you, Johnny. I'm honoured that you. Yeah, you would yeah, yeah. Ask me. Thank that. you, thank you, very much. thank you, thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, uh, Johnny, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Ah, fine. Uh, so should right. I continue? Should I continue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, okay. Uh, so, Daniel, it is very interesting that your answer was uh, really, really insightful. Uh, but I want to say, philosophically speaking, like we are never our history. Actually, we are the creators of history because history is a condensation of culture, the living practices. And also, like the condensed, uh, uh, condensed history uh, gives out culture. This is a mutually actually supporting thing, mutually, mutually supporting thing. And it is so interesting when I hear that like in, even in Adelaide, there are uh, exhibitions now being curated by interested curators or interesting cur curators like uh, they who put the contemporary art uh, along with the kind of traditional and folk art. Uh, we know that like in Australia, Aboriginal art is very important. And interestingly, there is a kind of uh, a larger awareness and a kind of larger economic interest being uh, developed and produced for market purposes all over the world. It's a kind of global scenario in which folk and uh, traditional arts are being uh, brought back to the kind of mainstream uh, discursive sphere for, for particular aesthetic discourse. And more than aesthetic discourse, uh, actually, Daniel was creating a kind of very, in, very, very sharp aesthetic discourse out there, like when he was comparing the death practices and expressions like that. But uh, in India, as well as in some other countries, like when they talk about bringing the, the traditional and the folk art into the mainstream discourse, it is a pure economic discourse. You must have noticed that uh, of late, 
all these famous galleries have started promoting madhubani art gond art worli art etc etc not because that we don't have the uh, we, all of a sudden our contemporary artists have produced ceased to produce works of art or uh, nor they have nor they have got this uh, uh, idea that uh, uh, contemporary art no longer expresses uh, what the what the uh, times are or what the time should be it is because that contemporary art all of a sudden has lost its sheen in the international market and they found a sort of a eternal uh, eternally valuable and uh, a, a work of art or a certain set of work contestation of ideologies in any part of the world actually if you, when you look at the artists are making kind of art with eternal value the imageries and the philosophies the mythologies that they try to reproduce or try to delineate in their works may be very peculiar to that particular set of artists their cultural uh, provincialism etc etc but it is appealing to everyone because of the primordial experiences of human being Uh, who were actually like you know sixty thousand years, as I said earlier, like sixty thousand years had the experience of their initial aesthetic expressions. So in this way, the support given to the folk and traditional art today in India, I look at with a lot of suspicion. It is to kind of monetize in the absence of the contemporary art failing to monetize. other ways which which had been doing it for like you know uh, the, the market was milking the contemporary arts for quite some time anyway but it is absolutely important to understand that for the folk and the traditional artists suffering or no suffering corona or no corona no corona uh, market or no corona no, no market these factors these physical materialistic factors are not so important they have been doing it eternally time like for, for for many many centuries and they are still doing it and they are not going to stop it what they do is that they cleverly absorb the kind of imageries which is happening around around them for example like if you look at the kaligat artists there in bengal when indira gandhi was assassinated in 1984 they actually took the at that particular incident like uh, this uh, satwant singh and bian singh you know firing at indira gandhi they, that became a kind of patachitra for the kaligat kaligat artists when this 911 happened in the twin towers in in the us like it came into kind of folk parlance when in, in bike, madhubani madhubani if you if you look at madhubani you can see a lot of bikes bikes and cars and the trains and the planes etc etc even they may not be traveling in that they may not be using it on a daily basis but it has become all these things have become a kind of uh, living uh, realities and part of their daily culture making if you go to rekhurajpur in in uh, odisha you can see that the artists are actually simply making the old ramayana mahabharata things but at the same time like when they do some sort of a secularized uh, expression in their paintings like they bring in all these things but in their traditional idiom you know so my thing my my uh, my point in saying this is that the contemporary artists and the traditional and the folk artists differ fundamentally in their aesthetic approach contemporary artists need a particular ambience particular habitat and environment cultural environment to produce uh, you know works whereas the folk and traditional artists don't need it like it is a, it's a kind of living practice another important thing uh, daniel rightly pointed out that the, the contemporary curators and art fairs binales etc etc are making spectacular work they are creating spectacle out of art or art out of spectacle which has been which had been actually severely criticized by guy de bo the french a french philosopher in 1971 in his uh, the society of in his article called it's in his essay called the society of spectacle the society has been turned into not into an, a, a, a kind of a, a living reality instead it became a kind of a, kind of stand in reality stand in reality which has become a sort of a huge huge thing you know huge spectacular thing nothing is real which everything is 
spectacular. But it is determined heavily by the economic affluence of a society. America started it, like the post-Second World War scenario. There was a huge depression. Then by 60s and 70s, they brought it up. Their cars, their buildings, everything became huge. And their art became, became huge with the Andy Warhol and the, with the artists followed. We got into the similar scenario only in 2000s, the new millennium. We created, a, uh, we created spectacular art, uh, artworks. Like if you look at the works of uh, Subodh Gupta or Nandra Sharma or Bose Krishna Madhari, anybody, if you look at that, like it became spectacular, monumental, gigantic. Like, you know. But now, the economic conditions within which such a spectacular art, art forms were produced no longer exist. That economic condition no longer exists. So we need to find a way to wade through this turbulent or even rather uh, waterless situation. You have to wade through something where there is no water. There was a lot of water. You could play around. You could actually make a lot of splashing sounds like uh, like uh, David Hockney's uh, splash splash work. Like so, you could you could do a lot of things. You could do you do you could you could. You, your um, your sky was the limit. You could you could desire for. You could uh, think about. You could uh, you could ask for anything. You could demand anything, and you got it. The materials were abundant. At some point, art became so tired, so mundane in its aesthetic variants. Artists started looking for materials. Amit Karla knows it knows it for sure, very clearly because. Art made out of uh, staple prints, art out of uh, uh, made art made out of uh, razor blades, art made out of uh, uh, you know bronze, uh, what you call copper, copper wires, etc., etc. I mean any any material you take any material that is made into art, and so both Guptas became successful in taking making uh, steel utensils into spectacular art. So actually, the material became art. Uh, for a where, where is, for the traditional and the folk art folk artists it is not material come whatever may they have an expression they have whatever like if you if you look at madhubani madhubani painting the origin of madhubani painting is on the wall not on the paper oh, bahar. it was on the oh, wall bahar. yeah 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 so so i think like in 1940s no, not not in 1940s 1970s or 60s uh -huh. there was a there was an earthquake uh -huh. So everything collapsed. So some uh, German lady went for a research. She found out that uh, a lot of uh, artworks were made, made, made or done inside the broken walls, inside the homes, inside walls. Nobody used to see it because these were done by the Kayasta Brahmin women. And this lady asked them to do it for a kind of, uh, you know, Bhaskar Kulkarni, Bhaskar Kulkarni, and so many people were there yeah, for this. Bhaskar, uh, Bhaskar Kulkarni, Pupul Jaykar. They uh, all wanted to make it a kind of national thing, you know, and also to give them some money, yeah. you know, for this for this artist. But because of their Brahmin thing, they didn't want to do any menial job because they were doing art for their own enjoyment. But they don't. they didn't want to do it for others. So this lady, these ladies went to other people, the lower caste people, and asked them to do it, and they started doing it. They started becoming, that is where we get to this Ganga Devi, Maya Devi, and all these Devis coming from the lower lower ranks of this uh, Brahman. Once they found that, that these people are successful, these ladies were from the lower caste were successful, they, the Brahmins also started making, uh, you know, uh, Madhubani and Madhubani became a kind of a re re regional art form because very recently because of this this kind of caste dynamics and uh, economic dynamics. So we have to understand all these things. Not a single work of art in the contemporary art scenario is affected in that way. <coughs> no, <coughs> for example, like when the flood came in Bombay. Flood came in Bombay. Bombay was actually uh, sunk 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 under under the underwater submerged in, in water, not a single artist painted the conditions of Bombay underwater. Nobody painted there. Everybody was doing Jadish Kallat or TV Sandosh or Chintanubhatiya or anybody in that case. Everybody was continuing with the, their kind of work. They, they were not affected by anything. Whereas the provincial artists were doing at least expressing. Nowadays, you can see that everybody is doing Corona art. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know like that so my 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 point is like uh, uh, whether there is a market or not the folk and traditional artists are going to continue with their works but the contemporary artists need to really change the strategies and the, uh, and their, their working culture and working practice like that okay okay mm -hmm. thank you so much sir so by and large uh, we had a lovely beautiful talk with both of you uh, it's really a remarkable and meaningful session i think in mm. true sense it's a kind of a kala satsang it's a kind of a kala satsang with denny baba and uh, with, with with two great baba ji's of art <laughs> <laughs> just i'm joking so so i'm grateful to both of you for being with us and uh, thank you daniel thank you uh, johnny ml sir Uh, thank you so much have a nice day thank you uh, th th thank you amit thank you uh, uh, daniel thank you jaipur city live thank you very much daniel aap aap theek hain main theek hu daniel aur na platform to sharing your thoughts